Good evening. Is that loud? <laughs> okay, good. I'll move back a bit. Welcome to the First Unitarian Church and welcome to this Housing Solutions Now event. My name is Bill Johnston. I have the great pleasure of chairing the affordable housing team at the First Unitarian Church of Hamilton right here. We work on the issue of affordable housing out of a religious commitment to the worth and dignity of every person. As I'm sure everyone in this room would, ag would agree, to us that means that everybody, everybody, has a safe, secure, appropriate home they can afford. Our, or, um, our team last year did a couple of, um, three actually presentations working with St. Paul's United in, in Dundas. And we're, tonight, this event has been brought to you by our church team, the Hamilton Community Benefits Network, and the Housing is Home Alliance. Alliance? Coalition? I don't know. We have a range of people here tonight, homeowners, tenants. I understand there's even a few landlords. We may not all agree, but I trust that at least here tonight, we can disagree without being disagreeable and we can listen and learn from each other. We are all well aware of the challenges that this city is facing on housing affordability. Homelessness is widespread and visible, rents are soaring, evictions rising, and the price to buy a home is beyond the reach of all but the wealthiest. Our focus tonight is going to be mostly on sort of the, the people below the median income, those who are mostly, most of whom are renters. We're going to look at some significant decisions that have been made at, by city council in the past year or two. We'll look at the recent federal and provincial budgets related to housing. We'll look at the LRT project and pros the prospects for affordable housing along the LRT route. We'll look at what nonprofit housing providers are ready to build here in Hamilton, just about right now, and also what they need to make that happen. We'll look at some, at some publicly owned properties that, that will be used for housing, and then we'll break into small groups for discussions among some questions that we will be posing to you. At the root of a housing issue, or at least an affordability issue, is land. And so it's particularly appropriate that we acknowledge that we are a land that was and is the land of indigenous peoples. The Erie, the, Erie, the Neutral, the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and the Mississaugas. The British colonial government claimed ownership of some three million acres that included Hamilton through the 19, 1792 Between the Lakes Purchase for which they exchanged 1,180 pounds, either money or trade goods. The land is also covered by the dish with one spoon wampum belt, which was an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabek, which committed them to share and care for the land and waters, water resources around the Great Lakes. We express our gratitude for the land that sustains human life. We express our regret for the displacement of indigenous peoples and the high levels of housing need and homelessness among Indigenous people in our city, we pledge to work with Indigenous people and other partners to right these historic injustices. And just before I start, I want to acknowledge the presence of um, Melanie McCauley, who's the CEO of um, Sacagawea Nonprofit Housing, which is an active member of the Hamilton is Home Coalition. And our church is proud to have supported Sacagawea for, I think, eight years now. A little bit of some fundraising. And also here is uh, Justin Lewis, the, uh, who's head of the city's housing secretariat that is supposed to make all the policies that the city has been improving over the last year or so, make them work. <laughs> You'll need to be magic, Justin. <laughs> So in the past couple of years, as I hinted, there's some been sig some significant housing decisions at city council, as well as at the federal and provincial levels. At the city, 2022, that right, 2022, was saw the introduction of landlord licensing after more than a decade of tenants groups advocacy for that. Last year saw council approve the safe apartments bylaw and an anti-rent evictions bylaw. It's the first of its kind in Ontario. Both were the result of tenant advocacy, advocates from ACORN and other tenants groups, 
highlighted poor conditions in some city apartments or tenants who are being forced to, out of affordable rental housings to allow for renovations. The campaigns presented a webinar with a councillor from New Westminster, BC, where they had, um, a, 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 where they enacted an anti-renovation bylaw, which is very similar to the one that the city passed here. They held rallies and they refused ever to accept anything less than what they were hoping for. The Hamilton District Apartment Association opposed those, those measures, arguing that they were both unnecessary and that they would in, discourage investment to improve or build new units and thus ultimately hurt tenants. But in the end, it was the tenant groups that the city listened to. Whatever your views on these efforts, the city recognizes that it's cheaper to keep someone housed than it is to have them evicted and risk them becoming homelessness, homeless, while at the same time that unit that they used to be in, as it's vacant, the rent can be raised by any amount. Broad-based coalitions have strengthened the efforts of the tenant groups. The Hamilton Community Benefits Network, which you'll hear more from later tonight, brought together some 40 organizations when it was found, since it was founded in 2017. And the Community Benefits Network and the YWCA and nine other groups came together in the Just Recovery Coalition, which put out a rather significant list of recommendations, many of which were focused on housing. Two of them were the uh, um, landlord licensing and the anti-renoviction bylaw, and there were a host of others, which a number of which the city has adopted. So the city has created the Affordable Housing Funding Program with an annual allotment of $4 million starting last year and also has, has funded the first share of the three-year uh, multi-year housing reserve fund. So the city now has some money that they can use to leverage money from the other levels of government. In 2022, the Tenant Defense Fund was expanded. The city created the Housing Secretariat um, to streamline processing of affordable housing op, uh, projects. Um, and the Secretariat has opened an online applications platform to pre-approve projects. So the city is ready when the federal or provincial governments have money for affordable housing projects. The Housing Sustainability and Investment Roadmap was approved in 2023 to guide council and the Secretariat's work. And one of the things they have to do is produce every, every November before the budget is a plan for housing for the coming year. My notes got scrambled here, I'm gonna to have to read this. Um, the city also approved the uh, uh, Hamilton Alliance for Tiny Shelters. The, the Alliance is not yet, uh, the particular site the city chose didn't work, but uh, the, the Alliance is confident that sometime in 2024 we will be housing up to 24 people. The city approved annual funding for 73 units of supported housing at the Dorothy Day Center. They've approved annual funding for the YWCA's transitional housing at Carol Ann Place, Carol Ann's Place. Um, they approved using the Housing Accelerator Fund that was uh, money that came from the federal government, $93 million over the next three years. Um, they approved a $25,000 per secondary suite uh, grant um, if you meet a um, an affordability criterion. The affordability criterion is 100% of the average market rent, which is not deep affordability. The average market rent right now is $1,400. We need units at that price, I'm just noting, it's not deep affordability. Um, the city also exceeded by 20% the number of housings, the, the target it had from the province for the number of housing starts last year. 4,100 units were started last year, which is one of the highest totals. I tried to go back in history and find when it was higher, probably in the 70s, but that's a pretty good total. And that results in a payment of $17 million from the province to the, um, to the city of uh, um, Hamilton for its housing programs. That sounds pretty nice. It's a fraction of the amount of money that the provincial government basically took from the city by waiving development fees. We got some of it back. Some of these measures might have happened anyway, but many of them happened because advocacy works. It, it's kind of exciting to me as somebody who does a bit of advocacy to see, yes, advocacy works, organizing works. The city has also approved zoning changes 
um, to permit all across 85,000 uh, lot, residential lots in this city that single semis, rural houses, and conversions to four, met, four units can be built as of right, as well as secondary units. Again, as of right, that basically means you just go for your building permit. And as I will discuss below, the city has um, set aside four city-owned properties uh, for non-market housing. Um, so that takes the cost of land out of the construction of those and makes it easier to get rents lower. There has obviously also been a great deal of focus at the federal and provincial levels on housing. Um, many people call the federal budget kind of a housing budget. I'll get to it in a second. I'm going to start with the province. Um, so the province did provide some additional money for support for the supports that make supportive housing supportive. 152 million over three years. It's nice. It's not a lot. Uh, they have provided 1.8 billion in new funding, again over three years, uh, for housing-related infrastructure, which will help, um, is intended to help increase the, uh, the housing supply in the city. Municipalities have permission to um, introduce vacant housing taxes, home taxes, which Hamilton had already done. Um, they also have permission to lower uh, the tax rates on multi-unit rental properties. But the provincial government remains primarily focused on market housing um, and has set no affordable affordability targets within the one and a half billion, yeah, one and a half billion, billion, million, sorry, one and a half million units that the province has committed to build. The provincial government's funding to Hamilton for new construction of affordable housing has also averaged only about a third of what the city used to get from the previous government. This, this chart shows in red, the big bar, the average annual amount of money we used to get for capital funding for affordable housing before 2018. Um, and the blue bars show what we've got since. So we've almost approached, we're at about 12 million in the last number, so we're almost approaching half. Um, under the federal government, the federal government does deserve credit for getting the federal government back into a role with affordable housing and providing some funding for nonprofit housing. The conservative opposition has yet to announce whether they will be funding any nonprofit housing. Um, the April federal budget had a kind of a slew of housing initiatives. Um, and I'll mention some that might have some relevance for Hamilton. I won't mention the figures because, frankly, they're all quite small. But they have inter introduced a Canada Rental Protection Fund, which has been asked for for many years, to al allow nonprofits to buy and preserve existing market rental housing that's still affordable, to preserve it forever, if they're a charity or what, whatever. Um, they, um, the federal government provided some additional funding for housing-related infrastructure. They provided some new uh, and badly needed funding for our homelessness programs. Um, federal land is being made available for, um, uh, for housing, and there's even a fund to buy additional land for housing. Um, they made a, and this again was much asked for, they've made permanent the Rapid Housing Initiative. The Rapid Housing Initiative was a very successful program when it provided a billion dollars or a billion and a half dollars a year. The permanent program, unfortunately, has less than a billion dollars over five years. Um, the federal government has proposed a uh, Tenants' Bill of Rights um, that is at least potentially a good idea. It's really provincial territory, and the question will really be who's going to enforce it. Um, there is the federal government provided additional funding for asylum seekers, which uh, the, the homeless shelters in this city have certainly been asking for. Um, and they are providing low interest loans of up to 40,000 to help homeowners build secondary suites. I don't know whether those will be able to be piggybacked on the 25,000 that the city is going to be providing. The city's is a grant, I note. All of this could help, although the funding, as I said, several times now, I guess this small. Um, as well, through the Federal Accelerator Fund, 
which uh, was announced last fall and, and commits $93 million to the city over the next three years. The city has been able to do, um, do or staff a number of things that will help, for instance, speed up uh, housing project applications, identify land, other land that could be used for affordable housing. Um, and it, it also uh, should leave a pot of about $26 million which can be invested in new affordable housing. Sorry, I'm one slide behind. Um, there's a but. <laughs> so between 2019 and 2023, about $381 million has flowed from the federal government for housing programs here in the city. 60% um, of that was loans, and the rest was grants. Uh, more than a third of that was for repairs, um, but we badly needed those repairs. But the net number of new units that are being built is 992. So divide by five, that's about 200 units a year. As I note down here, we have six, roughly 1,600 identified people known to be homeless. We've probably got 8,000 people on or can't even get on this wait list for sub subsidized housing. And we got 28,000 households, and this is always a very low estimate, that are in core housing need. So 200 units a year is better than zero, but it's, not, it, it's just not meeting the need. And overall, the federal and provincial share of the money that the city spends on all its housing programs is declining. The city has increased its funding in 2023 by 16 million and this year by another 23 million for its housing programs. But partly that's just offsetting declines in the federal and provincial government. Last year, city taxpayers paid 51% of every dollar the city spent on housing related expenditures. The city estimates by 2027, the city taxpayers will be paying 90%. The governments with the real money will be paying 10. Sorry, this is mostly a night focused on solutions, but context matters. <laughs> Let me now introduce Carl Andres and Mohammed Shalal Fay of the Hamlin Community Benefits Network. Click forward. Hello everyone, thank you for being here. Thank you to Bill for that great introduction um, and for helping making this happen. My name is Mohammed. Um, I'm the Community Engage Engagement Coordinator for the Hamilton Community Benefits Network. Um, just a little bit about what the HCBN is. Um, essentially, we are an organization that was founded uh, in 2016. We're essentially a labor slash community coalition. Um, that was formed uh, after the Hamilton uh, Metrolinx LRT was announced and, and fully you know, funded. I know there's been a lot of ups and downs with that. Um, and so as an organization, we advocate for community benefits, uh, affordable housing, uh, tenants' rights, and better, better public transit. Um, we exist primarily as a policy and advocacy group, and we work uh, pretty closely with the municipality. Um, and uh, you know, we serve on some of the subcommittees and committees uh, at City Hall to uh, advocate for community benefits. Um, and just for those who are not familiar with community benefits, uh, essentially the community benefits framework um, is, is it's a, essentially a way to ensure that large, uh, large infrastructure projects um, include some benefits for the people that really need it. For example, affordable housing, uh, environmental impacts uh, are, are accounted for, um, you know, transportation connections and things like, things like that. And this would typically happen through what is called a community benefits agreement, which would be an agreement that is signed by, uh, you know, presumably in this case, the HCBN um, and the city and whatever contractors are involved in, uh, in the project in question. So over the past couple of years, we have been engaging in quite a bit of uh, community engagement, um, specifically around the LRT, um, and to kind of get an idea of what people are feeling, what we can do better, what we can advocate on behalf of people with. Um, and as you can see here, in order of priority, the number one thing is affordable housing, to no one's surprise. 
Um, but there are a lot of other things that have intersections with affordable housing. Um, like people want to make sure that they're able to get to their homes uh, using the LRT and surrounding the LRT in an effective way. They want to make sure that the LRT also is producing, uh, you know, producing jobs actually for people in Hamilton that we're, we're trying our best to keep the money inside the city and not, uh, you know, delegate elsewhere. Um, and then also we want to make sure that there are community spaces, amenities, um, you know, greenery and things like that. And these are a lot of different things uh, that people are advocating for. Today we're just going to be talking about some of the things that uh, folks have been saying around affordable housing as it relates to the LRT. Um, but first we want to talk also about how the LRT also impacts different people differently. Um, it does cut through one of the most densely populated areas in the city um, with, you know, very, very interesting uh, uh, demographics being represented in the areas uh, that the LRT is passing through. Uh, as you can see here, 27% of Hamilton residents uh, live in the neighborhoods in the LRT corridor. 48% uh, uh, of the residents live in the LRT corridor are low income. And then of course we can see an overrepresentation of specific uh, ethnic minority groups, um, low income indigenous folks, South Asians, uh, West Asians, black Chinese, and so forth have um, you know, wide overrepresentation um, on the LRT corridor. So there are a lot of considerations to take into uh, account uh, as it relates to who's being impacted by this project. And so here are some of the community demands um, that we've been hearing through our P uh, consultation. We've had events, we've had surveys, we've had focus groups and such. Um, and as you can see here, there are um, quite a couple of ideas we'll be discussing later on tonight as well, but mainly people were thinking about um, the land, as, as uh, you know, Bill talked about earlier. At the end of the day, this does relate to the land. And uh, people are talking about, for example, things like ensuring that surplus land is donated to local nonprofits um, so that supportive housing or geared to income housing could be uh, built. Um, another, some of the other ideas were around, for example, having a set percentage of affordable units be included as part of these projects. Um, or, for example, set a number of units be uh, allocated near transit zones. Um, so there are a number of ideas that we have been communicating. We have created reports, uh, you know, with policy recommendations to the city. Um, so far, there's been, you know, a pretty good reception to these, uh, you know, demands, and the city is working with us. To, uh, to use our findings to inform their policy decisions. Um, and so we do serve on the LRT subcommittee and the community benefits committee um, at Hamilton City Council. Um, and then I'll pass it off to Carl. Thank you very much, Mohammed. So uh, my name is Carl Andres. I'm the executive director of the Hamilton Community Benefits Network. And I'm here to talk to you a little bit today about the policy and advocacy work we've done on housing and some ways the city of Hamilton could do more to provide affordable housing in our community. I'm just going to say one more thing about uh, LRT, and, and that's to, to take into consideration the impact that LRT has had on those vulnerable groups that Mohammed was outlining. Whenever you build a fixed transit corridor in a city, um, that is to say a, a light rail transit or a true BRT, transit corridor, it creates an immediate property uplift. It's part of the reason why governments build them in cities. Aside from rapid transit, we build them because they bring private sector developments. They encourage and increase the GDP of a city dramatically. And what happens when we put these fixed transit lines, even as they're announced, there is basically a gold rush in land development and gentrification, where developers rush into areas that have been traditionally economically excluded or have, had, have seen, I'll put it frankly, better days uh, along some portions of the LRT corridor and they start buying up um, older stock of, of housing or land banking that is buying land ahead of the LRT corridor, speculating on it. And then they start redeveloping those units, removing the existing tenants from those units, uh, raising the rents on those properties, or re redeveloping land that they purchase on the corridor for private market condominiums. So there's very little consideration of affordable housing when we do transit planning in Canada. It's usually left to the, to the municipalities to figure out for themselves, uh, very unfortunately. So although the federal and provincial government are paying $3.4 billion to build this, including buying 90 full properties, the most property acquisitions that Metrolinx has done of any of the other transit lines. If you add up Mississauga, Eglinton Crosstown, the Finch West LRT, and the Ontario line, the new subway lines, there is more property being bought in Hamilton than all of those projects combined in Metrolinx. Metrolinx is now a substantial landowner in, in the city of Hamilton, or will be by the time, and they are buying full properties because the corridors, I'm 
sure many of you have driven through the city. We have buildings that abut the corners. There isn't a lot of what they call right of way. So if the Metrolinx need to expand a sidewalk or turn a change a turning radius, they have to buy a whole building. Um, and they have bought full buildings, and they've displaced about 150 tenants um, with varying results, as you've seen from some of the reporting in The Spectator, with varying treatments of tenants being, some of them being treated incredibly well if they're loud, others being left to be evicted by the landlord before the property is sold. So it's been a very, and of course, this has had ripple effects across the entire corridor in the housing market near that. So I just wanted to set that stage. <laughs> And one of the interesting things that we'll talk about now is the erosion of the lower rental stock. Many of you know that in the last decade, Hamilton has lost over 16,000 market affordable housing units. That is private sector units that were below $750 a month owned by the private rental market. The not-for-profit housing providers have been unable to make up that shortfall. We're losing approximately 29 market affordable housing units for every new one brought online. That figure can seem stark, along with some of the figures presented today by Bill in our introduction. Production. Although daunting, there are things the City of Hamilton can do to both stem the tide of affordable housing loss and build more units. And I want to dive a little bit deeper into what Bill mentioned in his intro. The City of Hamilton has passed several crucial bylaws that HCBN was proud to advocate for alongside ACORN and our other community coalition members. These include that new rental licensing bylaw that, when it comes into full effect in 2026, will see all of Hamilton's rental apartment buildings with more than five units inspected. Landlords will be required to keep those buildings in a good state of repair, and the bylaw includes yearly inspections. This will increase the quality of rental stock in Hamilton and prevent renovations for repair and, and renovation. That's a common tactic used by landlords. They will buy a building that has been under-maintained for, for decades by a negligent landlord that has a lot of, of repairs that need to be done in the building. These buildings are traditionally lower rent buildings, and some of those repairs may only be cosmetic in nature, and they will come in and they will evict the tenants from those buildings, displacing them, and then they will either, sometimes they will do extensive renovations that require building permits, other times they will slap up a new coat of paint and some fresh appliances and throw it back on the market at often double or triple the rent that it used to be at. So by having our apartments kept in a good state of repair, it automatically will, will, will remove that tool from landlords being able to do. The other, um, the other uh, rental licensing is being complemented by two other vital programs. That first in Ontario rent eviction licensing bylaw that Bill, Bill mentioned in, in the intro. It would require landlords to get, to get a license in order to renovate the, the, the unit that they're going to, to, to renovate. And along with the license, um, the tenant will be actually um, required to be notified when that unit will be available. They will be given first right of refusal, which is actually their law, um, their right under the, the LTB, under the Landlord Tenant Board, but it's, it's so difficult to, to enforce. Right now, if a tenant wants a first right of refusal, they have to watch the rental market and wait until that property gets listed by the landlord and then write a letter to the landlord. The landlord refuses to give them back their property. They have to take, get a lawyer or a paralegal go to the tribunal, launch a case against that landlord in order to get their unit back. And as you can imagine, this is a very lengthy, costly, and difficult measure. This bylaw will sidestep that by requiring the landlord to inform the tenant when the unit will be here. And one of the most revolutionary things about this, this bylaw is that it will require the landlord to provide the tenant with alternative accommodations at their existing rents while the unit is being repaired, and then move them back into that unit at the same rent they were paying before once the renovations are completed on the units. So this is a, a, a revolutionary uh, bylaw that is actually being looked at now in Ottawa and Toronto to follow suit that will make it incredibly difficult for the kind of predatory tactics that are being used that are eroding our public sector affordable housing. So that has been one of, of the, or two of the, the tools that the City of Hamilton has passed. Um, and then starting next month, the City of Hamilton Hamilton is also providing yearly funding to the Hamilton Community Legal Clinic to provide additional legal capacity for their staff. The way it is right now, if you have a landlord-tenant matter and you're a tenant, you have to retain a private paralegal yourself or you get 15 minutes with a legal aid lawyer on the phone and then you have to self-represent at the landlord-tenant board. Can you imagine facing down an effort trust or a giant conglomerate with three or four corporate lawyers who do this for a living yourself as a tenant? So what this has done is given the, the legal uh, clinic capacity to hire additional legal staff to represent tenants at the LTB and support their cases. In cases of rent eviction, and so that would be uh, N12 or uh, N13 uh, notices, also N6s, which are notices to repair, so uh, allowing 
allowing the tenant to file with the LTB to force the landlord to do critical repairs that they are behind on in their unit and what are called above guideline rent increases. So landlords can frequently apply to um, the LTB to increase it above the provincial average. The prov province caps rental increases every year at a certain percentage and releases those numbers once a year. And then the landlord has to inform the tenant in writing that they're going to increase their rent by that provincial amount and then the, the tenant will then pay that new amount. But it's usually tied to inflation. It's a relatively cost-effective uh, rental increase. However, they can apply for an above guideline rent increase of as much as the landlord would like that they can justify to the LTB and the LTB very often rules in favor of landlords with above guideline rent increase. So this would mean they spent a little bit of money repairing the building and then they asked the LTB to pass that cost on to their tenants. Um, so this would allow the, the tenants to have that, that legal representation to fight those matters uh, at, at the LTB, um, you know, at least putting them on a little bit better standing with, with the corporate owners. Although contentious, City staff is beginning to identify city-owned property that can be uh, provided to not-for-profit housing providers to build vital new affordable housing sites. The city must expedite this important staff work. There are a great many surplus and underutilized lands in the city of Hamilton property inventory. We need to look at every possible space we can build affordable housing. And your advocacy, when Bill's talking about things that you can do, your advocacy can really help di directly assist with that. As you know, there's been some pushback from NIMBYs and not wanting affordable housing constructed in their neighborhoods and they construct a variety of excuses for this but when you scratch the surface of it when you go look at the comments on on reddit or on social media what it comes down to is an anti-poor bias often and isn't really grounded in the things that they're arguing for um, so I would encourage you to have those difficult conversations with your peers at work in your communities grocery shopping whenever you can to take that moment and be an advocate to push back against those ideas if you hear them in peers and I'm not saying perhaps they're are a bunch of folks here who don't have any peers like that. I hope that is the case, but if you do have some in them, I would encourage you to take those extra moments to just advocate for affordable housing and for city land use for affordable housing. Those are tough conversations and folks need to understand how dire the need is. The city also needs to get serious about the construction of large buildings and increased density on city sites that are released to the public. Take the Barton Tiffany project. I understand the vision for this project is a 14 acre site and an arts and cub arts arts a creative arts hub sorry that will include film studios production facilities potential employment and education spaces for training in the creative trades industries some public space and 750 homes details on the number and criteria for the affordable units and the subsidized studio spaces for artists have yet to be fully disclosed given its location uh, right near the West Harbor GO station and future LRT, this is a laughably small density profile for 15 acres of publicly owned land. In contrast, the City of, Hamil uh, City of Toronto is developing a 2.44 acre site at 244 Eglinton Avenue East. This project will consist of two co-op buildings and a market ownership building, creating 918 units on a fraction of the space that we're talking about. The site will also offer 3,580 square feet of community space and 12,000 square feet of retail space. The available land is finite, government land more so. If we truly want to be serious about affordable housing, the city of Hamilton has to get into the mindset that other cities like Toronto and Ottawa have in building high-density mixed-use housing buildings. And as an ambitious city, we often lack ambition. We haven't seen a tall building affordable housing complex built in this city since the 1980s. We need to provide funds to establish a building and land acquisition fund. Currently, the City of Hamilton does land banking through delegated staff authority that involves a $30 million rotating line of credit, which authorizes staff to procure industrial lands. They can sit on those lands and then resell those lands to industry as needed. On screen, for those who are really interested, are the two staff reports that built the policy for industrial land acquisition. This policy has successfully created a return on the procured land and encouraged economic developments. For example, if anything was to be learned from the Barton Tiffany example, it is the value of land banking by municipalities and the, the value of acquisition funds for municipalities. The Barton Tiffany lands are only surplus because we didn't need them for the stadium. 
and they have we we managed to accrue a massive amount 14 acres near a transit site of land that we bought at a very low cost when when housing was much lower before you know the the full funding for the LRT before the stadium was constructed for those of you that remember that debacle and i would suggest that the municipality take a much more active role in land banking and affordable housing building acquisition so this is the other way that the city can through delegated authority establish is buildings come up for sale all the time landlords die, they want to divest, and what ends up happening is those properties go out on the market, and within those properties are a lot of those market affordable housing units we talked about. People who have grandfathered rents, who got increased the yearly rate, who've been there 5, 10, 20 years calling that place home. Some of them paying as low as three or $400 a month for a one-bedroom because they've been in that building for so long. Well, that building goes out for sale, and the City of Hamilton currently has no policy to procure private sector multi-residential multi units that are put out on the market. We just don't have the ability to do so. Having a delegated staff authority with a line of credit would provide staff with the nimbleness to, to purchase those buildings and then work out agreements with either with other not-for-profit housing providers and then programs like the CMHC MLI Select, which is an apartment purchasing a fund that can be used to, 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 to properly or to, to maintain the mortgage on that building and then collect rents from, from the, those buildings. Um, we have no policy to do that. The federal government, as you heard from Bill, has announced that they are creating a fund to allow not-for-profit housing providers to do acquisition. So if we can get ahead of the curve with our own policy, we will be ahead of other, other jurisdictions in applying to that fund because we will already have that practice in place. We need to pass an inclusionary zoning bylaw. <laughs> Changes by the Ford government have hamstrung the inclusionary zoning as a strong tool for creating affordable housing. However, we still have the option to pass the bylaw, and staff work is slowly being undertaken on this critical tool. Under the current regulations passed by Doug Ford, only 5% of the units in a building of 10 or more units located in what they call a PMTSA, protracted major transit station area. It's just a fancy way of saying approximately 800 meters around the future LRT stops or any of our GO stations. So you draw roughly a circle around the, around the center of those station stops and anything built within those that's more than 10 units would be eligible for uh, affordable, uh, for inclusionary zoning and creating affordable housing. Just to give you a, an example, um, if, and I'm sorry, one of the other policy changes that Doug Ford made was unfortunately they set a 25-year limit for affordability for those, those units. Uh, it used to be up to the municipalities to decide, and um, municipalities like Toronto had decided 99 years for their inclusionary zoning policies. Um, it would be a large area of the lower city from McMaster to, to Eastgate from the mountain almost as far down as Barton. So any developments over 10 units in that catchment area. If we'd passed this tool 10 years ago um, on the between 16 and 20,000 um, new condo units that have been constructed, we would have netted approximately 1,400 to 2,000 affordable units through this program. So work needs to be done on that. It is being undertaken by the City of Hamilton, but like many things, it, it's taking a quite, a quite longer than those of us in the activist circle would wish. <laughs> Um, I would suggest that they also finish the work that started last term of council on reimagining the Hamilton Future Fund. The Future Fund is all of our money that was created when the city of Hamilton sold off Hamilton Hydro. Our publicly run hydro utility was sold off by a previous councillors and mayor, and that netted a... a as you can see here from, the, from the, the, the balance of the future fund, that netted a good little nest egg for us that we could be using um, for affordable housing. The fund has between 65 and $70 million remaining in it and has been used in the past to loan out to McMaster and Good Shepherd, as well as loans to other City of Hamilton um, units for various projects, including housing. Reinventing this fund to provide stable source of short-term loans to not-for-profit to get projects construction ready, pending CMHC financing. For those that don't know, it's a long journey, and I'm sure you'll hear a little bit more about this from, from, from our, our other speakers, but it is a long journey to get to CMHC funding when you wanna build an affordable housing unit. You have to own the land, you have to have a building permit, you have to have the designs and specifications and architectural drawings uh, done, and you have to have a history of construction, and then you can apply for CMHC, and eventually they will send you some funding, and depending on which program that you apply to, that may be a 100% mortgage only. That will be no government grants. That's only just to get a mortgage so that you can go ahead and, and construct that. By using this 
$70 million that we have here as a catalyst fund to provide those loans to non-market housing providers so that they can nimbly get to that CMHC ready stage and then repay the fund would generate an infinitely more amount of housing without any impact on the levy, which of course everyone is always concerned about. The other big uh, policy that we would advocate for at the Hamilton Community Benefits Network is a municipal housing bond. With our AAA credit rating, this could be a tool to raise half a billion dollars to invest at relatively low interest rates into large-scale community housing. And municipalities like Toronto have already successfully explored this tool. As you can see, the municipal, uh, Toronto is on its fourth set of social bonds. They do use them for other things than housing, but again, that is an option that is available for the City of Hamilton and something that we can, can do right now if we have the political will. Lastly, the City of Hamilton, as you heard from Bill, has been making massive contributions to affordable housing, pulling well above our weight compared to the federal and provincial governments, given that we only have property taxes as our primary, as our primary tax tool. So another option for the city, and perhaps unpopular, is the city could add you know, millions more to the property tax levy to provide operational funding for not-for-profit housing providers to end chronic homelessness. The political reality is such a significant tax increase would face vocal backlashes. I'm sure you heard from many of your neighbors when we were talking about 14.1% that got whittled down to 58 through a, a series of, of putting off some, some programs, dicking, dipping into some reserve funds, and, and, and deprioritizing some other items for other years. So this conversation is perhaps the most impassioned that we can have, is that the city is seeing increasingly less money from other levels of government and responsible for more of the burden of taking care of our most vulnerable residents. So an increase in property taxes um, would provide steady operational cash that would help not-for-profit housing providers who are mostly getting mortgages now, not, not grants from the other levels of government to construct and then pay for the operational costs of, of housing folks in their program. There's actually cards that you'll hear a little bit more on your table that actually outline uh, projects that could be used to build 480 88 units, I believe, of, of supportive housing, so the kind of housing that people who are suffering from chronic homelessness need in terms of wraparound supports. I mean, you'll be hearing more about that from our other speakers. So that is everything from mine. And just to finish out, I just want to remember to, to remind you, besides reaching out to your elective uh, leaders and demanding they invest more, you can be a strong advocate for these policies, again, just by talking to the people that you know and talking about the, the some of the solutions that we can have. But ultimately, I want to remind folks that we pay far more to deal with housing on an emergency level than we do to, to house people regularly. It costs between two and $4,000 a month to, to rent a hotel room for an emergency overflow. It costs approximately $2,000 to $2,500 a month to operate a shelter bed. Uh, if you can imagine. That is a very expensive way to house people. And that's not talking about ambulance or emergency room visits. That is not looking at interactions with, with criminality or with our criminal justice system or with overtime for policing. It is very expensive to be reactionary in housing and much cheaper in the long run. The problem is getting to that long run requires a substantial investment in the, in the mid to short term in order to see that ultimate payback. So I would just encourage you to have those difficult conversations with your friends and family, your elected leaders especially, reach out to them. As Bill noted, we have had some good successes in the Housing Sustainability Investment Roadmap in, in some advocates of some very solid policies for tenants' rights, and this was done through advocacy and through grassroots organizing, so it is possible, and I'll finish off with that, um, my section but with, by saying that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carl. And just a minor piece of housekeeping. We will be providing the slides um, to everybody that's here, assuming we have your email. So if you haven't got your email, make sure you leave it at the desk. We, we probably got it if you signed up. And uh, we also hope to have a recording of this event so you can get to watch it a second time. And now, um, Medora and Graham. Okay. So Graham and I are changing the agenda a little bit and we'll be presenting together to represent Hamilton is Home. So for those who don't know, Hamilton is Home is a coalition of eight affordable housing nonprofit 
developers, which includes Indwell, YWCA Hamilton, and Sacagawea, as well as Kiwanis Homes, Victoria Park, Good Shepherd, City Housing. Did I miss anyone? So, I did ask actually, who? Habitat for Humanity. I knew I'd miss somebody. So we have been working together since 2020, really 2019 is when we first got together to start talking about how we could develop affordable housing together and what kind of a difference we could make. And, you know, I want to focus on the comments Bill was making about lobbying and advocacy. It does work. It is a positive way to move things forward. And a group like Hamilton is Home, when we collaborate together, we have more strength in numbers. We each advocate individually for YWCA. We advocate with our colleagues from across the country at a national level. But when we can collaborate together at a local level, we can really make a difference. And, and I think we've made some big moves. And so Graham and I actually are feeling really positive today about the direction of where our advocacy is leading and the potential that we could be building and seeing a lot of building happening in Hamilton soon. So the pressure's on, Councillor and Justin, because we have high, high hopes right now. So we have always been open to other nonprofit developers to come in and sit with us, as well as other types of stakeholders. We've had all three levels of government participate in Hamilton is Home. We've also had other kinds of financing institutions and support. Hamilton Community Foundation has been a significant support to us. So we've not been doing this alone, and we've been advocating at all levels of government. Right now, we have 19 projects that constitute 1,700 affordable and supportive housing at different stages of development, including over 400 supportive housing units that you see on that postcard. With about $500 million in capital investment between grants and loans, we can build 1,000 units right now. We're in regular communication with Justin and the Housing Secretariat, working very closely, and we're very hopeful about planning together. The city has really been listening to us through the Secretariat about what we need to do and how we need to get our projects moving. We have also talked endlessly with the federal government and done lots of advocacy. And I can tell you, I was um, with my YW, one of my YWCA colleagues in March in Ottawa, advocating at the PMO's office, advocating for investments we think are critical for women's shelters and transitional housing to be put in the budget. That was something that was not in the budget, not at all. Um, it's in the budget now. And it's 100% contribution. Now, we're still waiting for all the details, how much is going to flow out, how much is really contained in that. But that was a lot of work we did over the last year. We've had local MPs listening to us, but we've had MPs from across the country and all parties listening and pushing that message. So, it, so again, it does work. It is possible to make things happen and change happen. So the devil is always in the details, though, and we're waiting for all the information. Last week, Hamilton is home. Uh, some of the members met with uh, Deputy Parliamentary Secretary, Deputy Minister of the Housing, of, housing, um, of Infrastructure, actually, Kelly Gillis, about the federal budget and the housing investment. And what we heard very, very clearly from her is that the amount they put in, the $1 billion to top up existing housing programs, they're ready to roll out. And we just got news um, last week of some money that we're going to get as a result of that. So they're, as long as we have applications in, they're ready to roll out funds. That gives me great hope. They also have new funding investments, which include $6 billion to infrastructure. Those are new projects, new programs. It's going to take a while for them to put that together and coordinate. But what we saw was Infrastructure Canada and CMHC working together to figure out how to deliver on those. Our message was very clear. You can't wait till the fall. They certainly don't have a year. And they can't wait till the fall to make this happen. There are projects ready to go now. And the reality is, if they don't start getting money out the door, we could lose some of the projects. So we're very hard on pushing the message. You're doing good. You're getting things. It's, you have the potential to get things done, and now you have to get moving. So that's the lean we're putting in on the government, is to, federally, is keep going forward. And we're doing the same with the city. 
The province is certainly part of the solution, um, lagging behind. You know, that's a kind way of saying it, yeah. right? But this morning, Graham was with, uh, with whoever, Neil Lum MPP Neil Lumsden, who's a friend and supporter of, of what we're doing through Hamilton's Home, and, and Rob Flack to make, you know, another re-announcement with Melanie actually was there from Sacagawea, right? So they're looking at this, they're looking at the Oaks and they're saying, this is an incredible project, how can we do more of this? They're asking the right questions, the conversations are happening. What we need to do is continue to push them. Their investments are really, really critical at the provincial level to the supportive housing envelope. On the supportive housing envelope, it's not just capital investment we need, it's actually critical supports. And that's the job of the province to fund that. It's not the job of the city, and it's not the federal government. So the province really needs to step in into the operating funding. When we build supportive housing, we all piecemeal it together between federal, municipal, and provincial. It doesn't come at once. It comes in bits and pieces. And of course, then we go to our communities as well, and we ask donors to contribute and invest in us as well to make these projects viable. And those are, that's a lot of hard, long work and labor, but we know we can start projects with hope in place and some real cash moving us forward. So we, have, we, we don't lose hope when we say the province is lagging behind. We say, okay, we just have to chase them a little harder. We've got the other ones on board, now we need to continue to put the pressure on the province. In terms of who we're talking about with supportive housing, because this is a big, big piece. We, could, we can move 400, over 400 gram units of supportive housing right now that could be done we say 12 months 18 months we can get these projects built constructed and move people in those 1600 people that have been identified as homeless i would say the number is probably higher we don't count well so but we can take 400 people and the goal with those supportive housing is really to focus on that very the um the unhoused who have been unhoused for a really long time and there's a particular type of design needs that go along with that population. You know, we talk about this as a housing crisis, but it's far more than that. It's a broken social safety net. And these people fell through the cracks a long time ago. And what you see in the pandemic, through the pandemic, was the rise of encampments. We've been talking about these people being unhoused. They were literally people in the woods, literal people in the cars, in sheds, you know, couch surfing, they've existed for a really long time. We just haven't been good at seeing them and tracking and recognizing them and getting government to respond to it. So we know they're there. Our units have to be designed and built to support those individuals. You can't just put up regular housing and say, we'll just house people. It doesn't work like that for those people who have been chronically underhoused. Many of them are dealing with mental health issues, substance use, which are very complex and they need lots of supports. We have an overrepresentation of indigenous people who are unhoused in our community. They need cultural competent programs. They need Sacagawea. And then we have women and children fleeing violence who have been trying to figure out ways of survival and in and out of really dangerous situations for a long time. And a lot of the women we're seeing who are unhoused have been unhoused for over 20 years. We have 40-year-old women who've been unhoused for 20 years, who've come out of, they haven't, in their whole adult lives, have never actually had stable housing. So they need a lot of intensive supports. And we need to think about the complexity of housing and, and the response we're providing. And we have to be careful when we're always calling it a housing crisis, because it's much more complicated than that. But at Hamilton is Home, we take that approach. And a number of us, between Good Shepherd, YWCA, um, and, and others are providing emergency responses in the community to this. So while we're trying to build permanent long-term housing, we're also working with the city on helping us to provide that immediate and emergency response. And so that's where critical funding comes in just to help people get off the streets and be safe. Um, so trying to do it all is a lot for nonprofits to carry. We know it's not all our responsibility. We all have to be in it together. But I think the one thing you can think about doing is the investments you make 
in nonprofits like the investments you're making in Sacagawea, like the investments you may have made in Dwell or YWCA or Good Shepherd, are, are getting this work done. This is where possibility happens. Nonprofits need to be part of the solution. We're critical parts of the solution, and we need our governments to understand that and continue to fund, that, uh, fund us and advance money to us to make these projects happen. I'm gonna turn it over to Graham now to add some more pieces. Thanks, Midori. You've covered a, a lot of ground, and uh, thanks to Bill and Carl and Mohammed as well. Fundamentally, um, we have to remain hopeful, but you know, and I, and I personally am somebody who would generally find the hopeful opportunity, but right now, gen, I genuinely believe that we're on the cusp of making some headway. 2020, 2023, we struggled as a city to get our co-investment together. The city has to make a co-investment, the federal government calls it, in order to leverage those federal funds uh, with the Secretariat, with the budget this year. Uh, that commitment was made by council, which is really important. Now, and we're on the cusp of uh, hearing from Justin about the, the recommendations for all of the applications we put in. Uh, just this afternoon, I was reading in the Globe, I haven't read the article yet, just the, t you know, the Twitter, uh, but uh, the Fed said to the province, you were too slow getting money out the door, $350 million. We're gonna work directly with service managers, with municipalities. Well, we should have our mayor get her hand up like first thing in the morning and say, Hamilton is ready. We have 1,700 units. There's the map of them right there, ready to go starting tomorrow. Indwell has a building permit sitting at City Hall, ready to pick up to build 23 townhouses for families who are currently in emergency shelter. Henry, we could say you're ready to go tomorrow and you'd say, how about Friday? But we'd, have, we'd be underway, we'd be underway. And the reality is though, is that we just are missing a couple funding pieces. Medora mentioned the province. Um, we did have the opportunity at the Oaks today to uh, welcome our local uh, MPP and, and minister, Neil Lumsden. He's fully aware of what uh, can happen in Hamilton. Uh, Associate Minister Rob Flack, uh, he's from St. Thomas. He's also very aware of of what supportive housing can do. St. Thomas is one of the only communities in Ontario where homelessness is actually going down. They've had a 50% reduction in homelessness over the last three years. Why? Because city council made a decision called the Compassionate Community Approach. They said, we're gonna coordinate community partners, agencies, nonprofits, housing providers, indwells one of those, and we're gonna build supportive housing, purpose-built supportive housing, and we're gonna mobilize uh, other emergency responses towards ending homelessness, 50% reduction, 30% just in the last seven months. So the minister and the associate minister are clearly aware of what can work. Now in Hamilton, why don't we put up our hand and say us next? The mayor was there, she knows. Councillor Non was there, she advocated as well. So if we can, you know, sometimes we gotta get past ourselves and be willing to work across lines. Um, we're all partisan in one way or another, but we've got to find uh, points of common cause. This is the time, and we really wanted to focus tonight on how do we move these conversations forward? What can we all bring to the table that can make us uh, achieve these goals? Medora mentioned that Hamilton is Home got started a few years back. It was just before the pandemic. We got together, Mr. Tassi, it's actually Federal Minister Tassi's question to us. She's like, what's it gonna take to move the needle on affordable housing in Hamilton? We started all squawking about, oh, CMHC and this and that and blah, blah, blah. We realized, like, honestly, if, if they just said, fine, here's $100 million, what are you gonna do with it? We'd have to scramble, because we weren't prepared. We didn't know what we would do with it. We were just used to complaining. We weren't used to cooperating. So we had to sort of step away from the, uh, the brink. We had to look in the mirror. We had to look in each other's eyes and say, how do we work together? And uh, I think most of you have this postcard on the front there. We had never, we'd all sat around round tables for affordable housing and flagships of this and that. But we'd never actually talked to each other about our business models, about our program models, about what you had in the pipeline, what were the barriers that each of us would face. And over the last few years, one of our biggest accomplishments, I would say, is that as a community of providers, we've figured out how to talk and work together. So we've put together postcards like this. Pardon, apologies for the uh, font. The printer somehow shrunk it. Uh, this was not, uh, this was not, uh, the intention, but if you look really close, uh, you can see the uh, the fine print there. Fine print's always important, I guess. We actually wrote down the addresses of eight specific housing projects that are directed towards in, uh, dealing with the encampments, dealing with supportive housing. So when we uh, drive down, well, any street, uh, you know, the problems that we witness can be solved, to, Medo to Medora's point, with tailored housing programs that require this kind of investment 
Medora's project there, 2.1 million CMHC loan, ideally no loan, but 2.45 million in, in grants. We need 13 million from the Ontario, Ontario government. Sacagawea's project, um, recognizing the need for Indigenous-led supportive housing. Indwell actually sold Sacagawea, one of its development sites, and said, well, why don't you lead a project for supportive housing and we'll support you from behind. Uh, 40 units uh, at 204 Gage North needs 5.8 million in CMHC loans, 3 million in CMHC grants, and actually has already secured uh, $6 million in Ontario uh, uh, capital funding. So just keep going down the list. That's, that's the level of integration that we have now. And if you flip the card over, you can see 418 units of supportive housing, $23.4 million in operating. To Medora's point, that should not be coming off of our tax levy. That's mental health and addiction support services, healthcare. That's the province's responsibility. So when we get mad at somebody, let's get mad at the province and say, get the job done, send the cash. 23.4 million in Hamilton's healthcare budget is like a drop in the bucket. We've got big hospitals, we've got big research, we've got big spending. Let's see big results for just a drop in the bucket. And then you can see the breakdown there. So when Minister Fraser says we're just going to go around the province and go straight to the municipality with capital, uh, Justin's going to quickly write a letter for the mayor to send, and it's going to say, uh, you know, we need 60, 62 uh, 60, $63.07 million in capital. Send it tomorrow, and we'll start construction by the end of the week. That's literally how ready we are to move with this kind of capital. So I think there's a letter on your table. Bill, thanks for drafting that. If you, write, if you just sign your name, that's going to go to Minister Fraser. Good news is that he's got money now available. Why don't we just write it down? Say, hey, Mr. Fraser, we're ready to go. We'll put this postcard in there. We'll staple it to your letter. And he'll get a bunch of these. Uh, and who knows, maybe by the end of the week, uh, Minister Tassi will say he's coming down. You know, worse things could happen, right? Maybe it'll be next week. Um, <laughs> the point is, we're ready to go. And the good news is the feds have the money to do it. In the last thing, and I'll just say, you know, this is slight self-promotion, but it's an example of, of why we're cooperating. We've got to play to our strengths. Indwell has built over 1,000 units of supportive housing across Ontario over the last uh, few years. So we have some experience doing this kind of development. One of the things we've realized is a lot of you in the community, a lot of people across our communities, want to do something, have a little bit of cash, don't know how to in get invested besides, you know, making donations. But you can't really use your RRSP or, you know, your your pension for, for that. So we've got a, a new program called a community bond. And this is another example of how we as a community can raise the funding to say then back to our government, we're ready to go. Look, we've spent the million bucks to get to building permit for this project. We've bought the land and cleaned up the dirt. We've done such and such to get through zoning. And that's because our community rallied, mobilized resources, and then said, you know, show up and we'll celebrate. The last thing I'll, I'll, I'll mention, um, because I know we want to get to the breakout tables. So i got to find my little... I had this from this morning, because I said to... Uh, I, I gave this to the mayor, who gave it to the ministers. Um, you know, we, we, we went around the table at Hamilton's home and said, okay, you know, sometimes politicians don't know how to lead. The present company accepted, of course. Um, but they do know how to follow, right? They knew, do know how to, to listen sometimes. So we said, well, why don't you come to Hamilton for good news? And we made an outline of every month what you can come to Hamilton to do. Most of these are groundbreakings and ribbon cuttings. In May, you could have a press conference to announce the plan to end encampments. In June, you could say, okay, we're going to have a groundbreaking at uh, Sacagawea's property there uh, on Gage. In July, we could have a groundbreaking uh, for Kiwanis, or no, for, um, for YW down on Barton. And we just literally went through the calendar, July, August, September, October, November, so I'll give this to you if you'd like. Put it in your calendar. Call the minister and say, hey, are you coming to the November ribbon cutting? Uh, and they'll say, what ribbon cutting? And you'll say, city housing's new building. Uh, so sometimes you've got to tell them, you know, you've got to lead the horse to water, right? Um, but fortunately, this horse is thirsty. This federal horse, it really needs some good news. So uh, why don't we uh, start leading it to water? Anyway, I'll leave it there because I know we've got lots of conversation at the tables. But just want to say thanks for coming out. We thought maybe 40 people would come tonight. So this is a... I think doubled our expectation, and we're really thankful for your commitment to positive action and pushing those who will decide for, for us how to bring the resources to Hamilton that we need. So thank you. Thank you, Graham, and thank you, Medora.
I was going to spend a very brief moment on, and I'll make it very, very brief, on uh, the, the properties the city has made available as one of the uh, steps that they've taken in the past year or so. Uh, they've identified um, four, five, count the two in Stony Creek as one. Um, there's a reason the city really pushed on Stony Creek. It's already zoned properly. And it was the only one of those sites that was identified that was zoned and ready to go. The other three will take, some, take a little more time. But that's really critical that the city provide that land. And the city is studying further properties that can be made available. But that's a big chunk of the cost of building a project. And with that, I will turn it over to Carl and Mohammed, who will guide us through, we'll probably take a quick break, and then guide us through the conversations at each of these tables. So um, as, as Bill said, we're going to take like five or maybe ten minutes just to get people stretch your legs and grab a coffee and a snack or something like that. And then we're going to throw some uh, breakout questions on the table and we're going to do a bit of a, a minorly facilitated uh, conversation. Like Bill said, there was more of you than we anticipated uh, coming together, so we might not have... Uh, Facilitators might have to float between tables just to kind of help you guys out, but we'll cover that in 10 minutes when we come back. Take, take a minute for yourselves and use the bathroom and grab a snack or another drink. Thanks. Starting with a Q&A uh, session, just a quick one, just to address any questions, concerns, or comments um, that we need, we need to address. So, you know, we had a great lineup of speakers uh, today. And um, you know we had a lot that was said, and we wanted to give folks an opportunity to you know ask clarifying questions. Um, so if anyone has any questions for any of the speakers uh, or anything that was covered today, um, you can you know raise your hand. You can either bring that mic to you, or you can if you can come to close to the stage, uh, that would be great. Again, so this, these are going to be questions to the speakers that we had today about anything they talked about. Uh, so please, if you have any questions, now is the time. We have one question in the back. Yes, please. Hello, is this speaker, okay, I'm close enough. Um, curious to the speakers, uh, for any young folks who are interested in taking leadership role in the realm of purpose-built housing, what avenues or educational opportunities they should look for? That's a good question. So that's a great question. There's no go to Mohawk, become an affordable housing developer stream. Right. So, uh, <laughs> one, I guess we could try to create one. Two, um, I mean, part of my role with Indoor has evolved, actually. We've created a new company called Flourish because then we can work with more nonprofits and charities. Part of that is actually evolving uh, to bring new, new people into this work, people who want to be driven by technical skills and, and such, but also see the results. So we've got a number of Canada summer jobs, uh, students, we've got other people coming out of uh, university and technical programs, so I'd be happy to talk. But I think that also within each of our organizations, there's opportunities to get involved in employment that leads towards development. How do we sort of learn the skills of business planning, of program design, of facility management, of uh, you know zoning, planning. Planning degrees are are popular, but you know how do you translate that? Not just like working for a big company, you know, paving the green belt or something. To instead do this. I mean, it's a lot of the same skills, but just directed to a different purpose. So there's lots of opportunity, and we need you. Uh, and we could talk maybe more in detail afterwards. Thank you. Also, just to add uh, for McMaster students, um, there is a program called the McMaster Research Shop, which does really great work uh, in the realm of you know just kind of looking into uh, the specifics of what we're talking about today. And there's also the Ontario Public Interest Research Group, uh, which does also a lot of great work. Um, so, if we hear about somebody that thinks we think they might be getting run evicted, what what are some things or resources we can share with those people? Yeah, that's a great question. 
Yeah, so um, first off, as I mentioned, um, uh, the Hamilton Community Legal Clinic will be having a, uh, a stream coming online very shortly. It was approved by the, uh, the uh, 2024 budget process of the municipality, so I'm um, reaching out to them. I would also encourage them if they, they have um, either phone or internet access to reach out to one of the tenant organizing groups. Uh, ACORN has been doing very vocal work, and also the um, programs that I mentioned being supported for rent eviction will, will also be supported through the Housing Help Center, um, which is another other uh, social enterprise not-for-profit organization that does housing work. So those are some of the, the touch points. Um, but depending on how far they are and if they've already received their N13, for example, I would definitely have them reach out to the legal clinic and the Housing Help Center right away um, um, to start with. I, the um, It'll probably be another month or so before the, um, the the tenant organizers have been hired on by through this program um, both on the, on the city side and through the through the legal clinic they're still navigating some of those but those are your your touch points and the, um, the, it would I'd immediately address them too I'm glad we were so informative thank you <laughs> that we left you with with, uh, with no questions so thank you very much for the folks who did ask questions um, we're gonna move into a, just a, a little bit of a, an exercise um, what I'm, I'm just gonna kind of give you a little bit of background so as I mentioned the Hamilton Community Benefits Network we're a policy and advocacy group so we're a not-for-profit um, that does a, a lot of work in in advocating we del do a lot of delegation at City Council we do a lot of, of, of meeting with with municipal politicians um, we do like to get a a, a broad sense of ideas from the community to help shape our advocacy. So what we're asking you guys to do today is to help us with that. You guys have heard a lot about some of the possible solutions. You've heard from some, some excellent speakers. Many of the faces I've seen have been at uh, some of the other housing events that have been hosted uh, in this space. So what we'd like you to ask you to do is um, to find someone who would volunteer. And if you're at a table that's only got a few people, if we could maybe crunch together a little bit, that would be really appreciative, but it's not mandatory. Um, what we'd like to ask you to do is to um, find a volunteer who would be willing to just take down some notes from the conversation. They can be point form, they don't have to be detailed. Um, we're going to collate all of that data that we collect from this, and it's going to help shape some of the advocacy that we do. And if there happens to be a really great idea scribbled on a piece of paper, I am more than happy to take that idea and run with it and pretend that it was my own. No, I'm kidding. But, <laughs> but very, very frankly, the, these types of engagement sessions, and we've done um, you know, close to 20 of them ourselves, really help shape the work that we do in our policy and advocacy work in, in, in our work. So you're helping us possibly with new ideas, new thoughts, new directions to navigate. So we've got some questions here that we'd like you to kind of use as your discussion touch points. They don't have to focus just on these questions. These are just some probing questions to help you guys. And we'd like you to you know, nominate uh, somebody to, there's paper on the table and pens, somebody to take some notes so that we can gather them up. And then we'll have some, some facilitators that will be bouncing between tables because quite frankly, thank you, there were more of you than we expected to come to this event. So we really appreciate seeing so many people. Um, so we can't put a facilitator at every table, so we'll be bouncing between tables to you know, answer questions, help conversation, um, to, to generally work with you all, but we'd like to hear from some of these questions here and any ideas that, that you have gotten through this presentation, if you, and they come up in the conversation, if you can record them, I really commit they will all be read and we will take them to heart when we work on some of our future campaigns for advocacy. So thank you very much for contributing and thank you very much for, for attending today.